Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is the second installment of uh, my lecture, Selected Topics uh, for Scientific Computing, um, Summer Semester 2020. Uh, you have seen the recordings of the first one, and we had some um, video encounter earlier to get to know everybody. So, um, as before, this is a recorded lecture. The material is online in the same folder, which you know since you just downloaded it. Um, let us uh, continue with um, section one, which is just uh, the contents. So do not expect to understand everything or have a deep uh, derivation. In section one, we will come back to everything. Um, I will just introduce today um, soon enough and look at it in more detail. So where were we? We were at uh, 1.4, um, having just introduced uh, arc trees and um, how we can encode the level-wise lexicographic encoding, um, how we can encode the level-wise lexicographic structure as a code that somehow aggregates the coordinates into a binary description. Um, so if you look at this uh, formula here, we see that uh, we of course have multiple trees in general, so I'd call them blocks. The domain is split into blocks. Each one we understand as a tree, refined tree, but we only go to a certain given maximum level, big L in practice, so we know exactly what's the uh, maximum pos possible number of um, elements in this uh, construction. Um, maximum level, big L, little l, the level of a certain element. So the origin coordinate uh, x, y, z are constructed as binary numbers. In the end, the coordinate is a multiple of the size. So you have the integer coordinate of all possible locations for this given level L. And then um, we shift this uh, to the left um, by the remaining number of bits, meaning we have um, big L minus little l zeros in the least significant bits of x, y, and z, uh, which gives us a number between 0 and 2 to the big L exclusive. And we can normalize this, of course, uh, if we want to have something in 0 and 1. So the length of uh, one element is, uh, again, this power, which you've seen last time already. Um, the tree number, we will just uh, consider this uh, known by context, so we will not encode this separately. And I introduced this number i, which is a bitwise uh, permutation of x, y, and z into some big um, code that is just one identifier that uh, uniquely tells us the origin coordinate of uh, some element. So I'm just repeating what a valid uh, element is. The least significant d minus l, these that I mentioned, um, must be zero for the origin to be an integer multiple of the size of an element. Um, separately, um, for each level, this is uh, this is the procedure or the the prescription. Let's say um, if I make a picture of the unit tree here, going up to um, rounded coordinate um, to um, well normalized coordinates one one, which discreetly is two to the power of big L. Then we see that those elements here are valid in the sense that the origin coordinates are integer multiples of the size, both for this bigger one and the smaller one. While this thing is not a valid element that would fail this description from the last page six. As a bit of a homework to get uh, used to this convention, I suggest you figure out some kind of formula or algorithm or expression uh, where you have uh, n valid elements indexed with i, x, i, y, i, z, i being the coordinates, l, the level, for each one. And then we know all of them are somehow descendants of the biggest root element, but maybe they are all descendants of some smaller element. So the task is to compute their smallest common ancestor, big x, y, z, and l tilde, um, by some preferably um, simple form. Um, I was talking about local al algorithms that basically modify a single element. We can mo modify multiple elements in turn to have some kind of consistent procedure for the whole refinement or mesh. And uh, supposing we have certain marks, so we decided where we want to refine the mesh and maybe 
um, where we would not want to do anything at all, then we can uh, look at the yes marks and wherever they are we refine, basically replace one element with uh, all the child elements. Um, coarsening would be the reverse, so suppose I am having yes marks on a whole family of children here of a bigger element that you see around here, we would then decide to coarsen these children into this big element. This is only we could of course think, well, there is one mark in this uh, small element, but if the marks in the other three are missing, we prefer to um, just leave it at that, which you see in this situation. That's this convention, you all siblings, siblings must agree on this tag. And um, another thing you notice is that these elements here are a lot smaller than these elements, which uh, as we find out later, will make things a little more complicated than it needs to be. Um, so there's another operation called two to one balance, which would uh, find all these neighborhoods where we have more than a factor two in size difference between neighbor elements. And then it would uh, insert refinement in this case here to make sure that we only have a two to one size relation between neighbor elements. So this is a global algorithm in the sense that uh, you can imagine if we made this element even smaller, we would need a propagation of refinements um, that can spread quite far through the mesh. So um, this is a long range effect, which makes this a particularly interesting algorithm compared to refinement and coarsening, which are really just element by element and don't have any implication on neighbors. We want to do parallel computing here. The previous algorithms are completely fine in serial. But um, of course, we want to somehow spread the work over multiple compute units or processes to have a faster time to solution. Um, and this can be done in multiple ways. So we can use a shared memory computer. Most of the laptops or desktops that we have these days have multiple cores, physical processor cores that are aggregated to the chip somehow. And they can all run a separate process simultaneously. And this process can um, operate irrespective of the other processes. And if this is physically the same machine, um, it is usually built in a way that the memory of this machine is shared. So any process can access any part of the memory in this machine, um, which is a separate model from say having computers connected by a network cable. And then it is, there is no direct way for some computer to access the memory of another. So this model is called distributed memory, um, where a process has local data, process local data, but that can only be a very small fraction of the complete set of global data, which is basically the union over all processes of all data. So both um, approaches are valid and practical and used a lot in, um, in science and industry. Shared memory, you can imagine, requires some kind of locking such that multiple processes don't write into the same memory location at the same time. Uh, then we wouldn't know which of the two results would actually be valid in the end. So synchronization is a major thing to be thought about for shared memory computing. For distributed memory computing, we just basically need some means to access remote data. And this um, is something that goes over the network. So there are solutions for both. There is the OpenMP standard, which is addressed originally at uh, shared memory systems. And there's the MPI standard, which is called Message Passing Interface, which is targeted at networked uh, computer systems. All of our algorithms need to be adapted to parallelism. And uh, the concept here is that each process owns a subset of all elements. So for each element, we decide on a certain process to be responsible and to store it since in distributed memory, the other processes will not store it, um, which uh, begins to make things a little interesting. Um, coarsening, for example, can only happen if all siblings are on the same process, because otherwise it would just not be known if other siblings have a yes or no mark for them set. If this condition is not met, we need to redistribute some elements first in parallel. That means we need to transfer them over the network from one core process to the other process. And of course, then uh, each process needs to send some message, but the other process needs to know it will receive a message, but how would it know 
that a message is coming since it doesn't know about the elements on the other computer. So we need to do some kind of encoding um, with hopefully little redundancy to um, organize how every process knows what kind of message and information is on the way. Our language for re redistribution of data in parallel is called partition in the sense that in these methods we have a unique owner process for each element, uh, which means it is actually a disjoint storage of elements. Not all data needs to be disjoint, um, but elements are. You can imagine that we can uh, search and traverse our geometry. We want to do certain uh, queries. For example, we want to find all elements that intersect a certain object for whatever engineering applications. Um, or for example, if you have some kind of earthquake receiver um, sensor, then the sensor needs to pick up the signal that you simulate. But of course, then we need to figure out which element um, encloses this uh, sensor so we can ask the correct process to um, write down the file for this uh, sensor data. We could want to find all elements that have some kind of distance requirement to some object, some kind of remote condition, for example, in astronomy or other long range methods. And since we are using trees, you can imagine that we can actually have very quick and efficient search methods. We will get there. I'll not spread this out here, but we need to make sure that we do not do certain things too. Um, for example, it should not be the case that one process communicates with every other process, and that holds for all processes. We will have a, um, a nonlinear growth in communication volume this way, which is too much for even the most uh, advanced networks in general. And then we can't just access elements of remote processes. We have to figure out how to send messages that only transport the information required and not information we wouldn't need. But of course, we don't really know um, what the situation on the other process is, right? So this, again, comes down to um, encoding techniques. And then we can develop long-range algorithms, for example, to do cosmology or molecular dynamics, where you have uh, certain molecules that need to um, interact with their neighbors to exchange molecular forces or electrostatic forces. Of course, visualization is, is the main thing when we need to search in because we have virtual rays of light that go through the domain and we need to intersect each light ray with an element, which is a fascinating application. Application, application. Um, usually we're just concerned with uh, simulation or the numerical solution of partial differential equations. At least at this institute or in our standard lectures, I'll try to go a little bit into geometry uh, and visualization, general applications that you do not usually see in uh, scientific computing, at least in the basic classes. But of course, in practice, these are hugely important and um, quite fun in their own right. So this was a very quick... Um, summary of what we are going to do and this is actually the beginning of the summary in more detail before we can actually do new stuff but uh, i hope some of the way i'm writing things down um, is um, at least not uh, completely boring since i'm trying to make sure that I have the minimal that i have the minimal set of definitions formulas and uh, smart conventions that we will use throughout. So this is supposed to be brief. Um, while we are here, I like to um, give out some, say, unofficial exercises every once in a while. And while we are on the way to establish um, some kind of collaborative computing or programming environment between you, uh, the participants here, um, I'd suggest if you have found uh, some person to work with, which is something I don't require, of course, but I suggest doing uh, for each of you, um, that you basically collaborate on a minimal program that just does, say, hello world or counts to 15, something like that. But you should be including a make file to properly compile everything. And I suggest that you somehow work on this thing together, the two of you using the repository or the revision control system Git. So one person could work on the make file, the other one could then test this or add another line to the code. 
um, you upload and download each other's contributions and uh, somehow together finish a version of the program that both of you like. This entails communication outside of the programming, which you can, of course, do by email or video chat or just um, writing letters by postal mail if you want to. Um, but this is something I would uh, suggest uh, to warm up um, your collaborative uh, exercise here. I'm not going to partial differential equation theory in this lecture. You know, all of you know this. You've had lectures on this and we have very little time. So I want to fast forward to actual uh, computing algorithms here. But nonetheless, we need some kind of background or basic understanding. And um, I'm using the usual notation of a mixed Dirichlet Neumann PDE problem over Sabolev space uh, H1 uh, over the domain omega. This is completely standard and you've seen this many times. Um, the Dirichlet boundary is uh, one part of the boundary, the other part of the boundary is the Neumann boundary. Um, so you've all seen a strong form. I'm calling G the Dirichlet boundary values and H the Neumann boundary values. You all know that the strong form is restrictive in the sense that it's uh, it presents difficult uh, theories for existence of solutions and it is actually uh, requiring a lot of uh, smoothness. Um, but even that doesn't solve all the problems we have with this formulation. So what people usually do is transform this setting into a weak form and multiplying with test functions, integrating my parts. And um, I'm doing this here in the sense that I have a subspace, a big H, which satisfies zero Dirichlet boundary conditions and is uh, within H1. Um, you know the basic um, theory to establish uh, such statements are the uh, trace theorems, which is uh, a part of functional analysis that we have at least skimmed in earlier lectures. And uh, we also assume that we can find some function in the sense that the function g is given such that it is always possible to find an extension into all of h1 of omega that satisfies the boundary conditions for g in some way that aligns with the theory that we are using to um, state boundary conditions. So test functions are in the same space as the homogeneous Dirichlet solution function that we call uh, w here because we want uh, to split our solution into one part that has the required Dirichlet boundary values and the other part that has zero Dirichlet values and their sum by the superposition gives us the solution. So um, if you do all this and uh, rearrange, we get a bilinear form little a and on the right hand side where the boundary values come in indirect uh, by inserting this ug function into the right hand side, you find the h and f functions from the formulation again and this uh, h function is evaluated on the boundary so this little big n is a boundary integral a bilinear form defined over the Neumann boundary. I'm just using standard um, elliptic equations as an example, but of course you can solve a lot more general problems using this formulation. We also know that the right hand side f over the volume can be generalized to be some um, element out of the dual space h uh, prime here. Um, this is all standard knowledge from um, PDE solving. Of course, we're solving discrete problems, not uh, infinite dimensional problems. So we need to do this by using some kind of basis. Um, so we usually choose basis functions in scientific computing. And um, so I don't have to, of course, basis functions require linear combinations to express some element of the space and then we begin to see indices that I'd like to avoid. So to those who are new to my lectures, I would like to introduce some notation that removes a certain number of indices from linear combinations um, and pairwise uh, products. So consider some vector A of coefficients and a set of functions. Maybe this is a collection of all basis functions. Um, big phi being a column vector of entries and the entries are functions themselves. So each component of this vector is a function. And then we can uh, just conveniently express the linear combination. Um, the usual sum a i phi i 
with uh, writing a scalar product between two vectors, a um, transpose phi, big phi in this case. So the result is just uh, a function in this case in the space that we've been building anyway. We can do the same in any dimension, say m for another function of uh, such construction, um, v in this case, and then we can use a bilinear form, in this case just as the inner product, to um, insert them. And now you see there are two functions. Each of these is one function, but we can use the linearity of the bilinear form to pull the coefficients and the sum to the outside. If we do this carefully, you find that you will get the transpose to the left and no transpose to the right. The result is, of course, just a number, since here we combine two functions pairwise, which gives us a number, and b and a are numbers um, as coefficients. So this is notation for a matrix with m rows and n columns aggregating all the possible combinations of uh, evaluations of this bilinear form for members of the vectors big phi and big psi. This is hugely convenient in many, many contexts. Um, and this applies to any bilinear form, not just a scalar product. And if we rewrite our variational problem from earlier with some generic right-hand side big L, which is a, a linear form, then we can insert our homogeneous part of the solution as a linear combination um, of basis functions that are all in the homogeneous space, meaning satisfying zero Dirichlet conditions, each one of them. And then we test them, not with V, but with every basis function in turn here. Um, we would write this as evaluation of big L with each member of the set of functions uh, separately, and then just comparing these uh, concepts and notes, you, you find that, uh, that the linear combination goes into the second argument here, this W function. You expand X, pull it to the right, and you have some kind of matrix that in this case is the insertion of each basis function pairwise into the bilinear form little a from our variation form, and we get very easily to our linear system that is now a square matrix um, valued problem. Um, basically, it's a square matrix that uh, defines a vector valued problem. So this is a linear equation in X. Thanks for now. I'll stop here and we will resume with a chat session later during the week. And I see everybody soon. Thank you.